I'm Lynn Packer with OUR Op-Ed 10, Tim Ballard's secret plan to monetize and proselytize his involvement with Operation Underground Railroad, with new information about Gesno Marty and Russell Ballard. Later in this report, a special section on Ballard's biggest fundraising lie, Finding Guardy, and Ballard's claim, repeated often over the years, we are closer than ever. In addition, also later in this report, prayer, psychics, and torture in the search for Guardy. A suspect in Guardy Marty's December 2009 disappearance was tortured by Haitian police in a failed attempt to find Guardy's whereabouts. A psychic who claimed to know where Guardy was being held as a labor slave is also connected to a Tim Ballard OUR nonprofit that failed to register with the IRS. But first, Ballard's secret plan. He unveiled it at a clandestine meeting in August 2019. It was a plan so secret that he asked the 10 or so people attending to sign confidentiality agreements. But now, 16 months later, at least one attendee turned a diagram of the plan over to Davis County investigators. They're conducting a criminal investigation into Operation Underground Railroad, its CEO Tim Ballard, and Utah Attorney General Sean Reyes. I reconstructed the chart from a diagram Ballard drew on a whiteboard during the meeting. The drawing shows multiple Ballard-controlled for-profit and non-profit entities, several paths for money to flow to Tim Ballard's main for-profit company, how OUR would bring more converts into the Mormon faith, a deeper involvement by the LDS Church's presiding apostle M. Russell Ballard than I had previously reported in Op-Ed 6, and OUR's takeover of an orphanage in Haiti in an apparent attempt to monetize adoptions. Ballard wanted to make millions. His nonprofit Operation Underground Railroad has millions of dollars in the bank. But he cannot simply write checks to himself at the risk of losing tax-exempt status. He had already taken his annual salary above $300,000 in 2018 before backing off that approach. One solution? Surround that nonprofit with other nonprofits and for-profits in a complex labyrinth of entities where money would eventually flow into his personal bank account. A bonus, the same publicity sizzle, that is what he called sizzle on his chart, that generates donations and profits could bring masses of people into the Mormon church. It was his capitalism begets church converts plan. At the top of the diagram, Slave Stealers LLC with three partners, Brian Norton, Tim Ballard, and LDS Apostle Russell Ballard as a silent partner. An outside nonprofit run by former OUR operative Paul Hutchinson was envisioned to donate to multiple entities. Ballard's use of the word sizzle was taken to mean that the nonprofits would attract donors by way of dynamic humanitarian missions, such as rescuing child sex slaves. Money would end up in Ballard's own company that would make more money with a new movie his speaking engagements, upcoming books, and some of that would go back to Slave Stealers, LLC. In this episode, I'll focus on three entities shown on the chart. Slave Stealers, the Haiti Orphanage, and Children Need Families Foundation. OUR appears to have taken at least partial control of a Haitian orphanage that has been mismanaged by Gesno Marty. More about that in a few minutes. The second whiteboard entity I'll put under the microscope is one Tim Ballard and his wife Catherine formed. They installed Janet Russon from Utah County as its director. Even though they called it a nonprofit, it has not been registered with the IRS. I'll begin with a look at the for-profit entity at the top of Ballard's whiteboard sketch, Slave Stealers, LLC. He claimed the Mormon Church's top apostle, Russell Ballard, is a silent partner. Video Op-Ed 6 dealt with the Covenant controversy and Russell Ballard's support of Tim Ballard's Slave Stealer book. 
Here Russell Ballard is pictured with Glenn Beck and Tim Ballard. Tim Ballard at the whiteboard meeting implied that Russell Ballard also has a financial interest in the book's spinoff, a proposed television series, also called Slave Stealers. Slave Stealers has a Farmington, Utah office address. It's the business address for Brad Brower, Russell Ballard's son-in-law. Brower and Russell Ballard declined interviews. Melissa Ballard, Russell Ballard's daughter-in-law, is a state representative. She's seen here on the right with her husband, Craig, and Jessica Mass, OUR's aftercare director, at a fundraiser event. She plugged OUR on her website by passing along Ballard's unproven and false fundraising pitches. She wrote, Amazing night for Operation Underground Railroad. In just five years, they went from saving 260 kids in a year to more than 1,200 kids this year from slavery. The most stunning statistic tonight, two million African slaves were taken over 400 years. Today, there are more than 40 million slaves. Slave Stealers, an existing book and a planned TV series. According to a press release, the proposed series designed to cast a light on slavery past and present is currently in development. Says Emmy-winning Nick Nanton is producing alongside Brian Norton and Ballard through their Stowaway Productions and Eighth Wonder Entertainment. And it says Ballard's Operation Underground Railroad, the nonprofit set up to combat human trafficking, is also involved. There are two slave stealers related entities not on Ballard's chart. One is 11th Street Films, LLC, and Stowaway Productions, LLC. Both are registered by Tim Ballard and associated with Nick Nanton, who directed the movie Operation Toussaint. What is not clear, where is the financing coming from? And when will production begin, if ever? Slave Stealers is also connected to Ballard's very recently released Sound of Freedom movie. The release of that movie had already been delayed by more than two years. It looks like no theater chain or streaming service like Netflix wanted it. Now its March 2021 release is by a small obscure streaming outlet and advertised for free and can be accessed via YouTube. Slave Stealers partner Brian Norton is also involved with two OUR-related St. George Area Firearms Training Centers, Fort Pierce Tactical Ranch and Salvo LLC. Norton is also rumored to be paying Ballard $900,000 a year for his piece of the whiteboard pie. Next up on Ballard's whiteboard chart, the purported nonprofit entity Children Need Families, founded by Tim Ballard's wife, Catherine, and headed by Janet Russon. CNF's business address is Janet Russon's home in Provo. Russon is the foundation's executive director. Board members are Tim Ballard, Catherine Ballard, and Tevia Ware, Catherine's sister. Ware is also OUR CFO and is paid about $100,000 a year. Although CNF claims to be a nonprofit, it is not registered with the IRS or Utah as required of nonprofits. It apparently provides donor tax deductions through OUR. In any event, there are no annual IRS reports. That severely limits what donors and taxpayers know about the entity that Tim Ballard put on his whiteboard chart along with the word sizzle. Brent Andrewson, OUR's nonprofit attorney, declined explaining if an entity can claim to be a nonprofit and solicit donations without being registered with the IRS. CNF is not Russin's first OUR related charity involvement. Her now defunct Little Fish Foundation once raised money for Gesno Marty's orphanage in Haiti. Her charity is not registered with the IRS, but she may have paid taxes and donors might not have claimed tax deductions, so it may have been legal. It appears she did continue operating the charity after its Utah's corporate registration expired eight years ago. Russin has a lot of OUR-related Facebook friends.
In March this year, Vice World News reported that Janet, the article did not use her last name, is a psychic who claimed to have divined where Guardy Marty was being held as a child labor slave. It was yet another failed attempt to find Guardy among numerous failed attempts. The Blunder Guardy rescue mission took place at a remote location near the Dominican Republic border. Here are a couple of photos from the failed 2014 rescue mission. Vice's story about the psychic begins like this. The rescue mission near the border of Haiti and the Dominican Republic was not going well. Operation Underground Railroad had arrived at a remote village seeking a missing child. Acting on what founder Tim Ballard had promised was a solid tip from a source. OUR's so-called jump team had entered the village, pretending to be part of a medical team, and quietly surveyed the scene. But the missing child was nowhere to be found. And then, to the dismay of several people on the ground, Ballard produced his source, a psychic medium from Utah, Janet. The person had claimed that many children were being held near this village and that Guardy was among them. Ballard, both sources said, even called Gesno to tell him that his son was coming home and summoned him to the village. Tim shows up with this woman, this very sheltered-looking soccer momish woman from Utah, one source told Vice World News. And he's being very defensive and won't let anyone talk to her. After a couple days, I figured out she's an effing psychic. That's his effing source. Ballard wanted to capture the Guardi rescue on camera, resting him from his slaveholders, reuniting him with his father, and whisking him to freedom on a helicopter Ballard had standing by. One of Vice's unnamed sources who was there said that Ballard was making decisions like a reality TV producer, he starts running around the village like an idiot. The cameras are following him. He's drawing so much attention to himself. But there was no rescue. There was no made-for-television dramatic moment. OU operative Mark Mabry was there snapping photographs, including one when Gesno Marty was told his son may not be there after all. An OUR spokesperson did not dispute Janet's involvement. OUR has partnered with Janet, who has referred to OUR by a U.S. law enforcement agency for some of our top-level cases. She has been very successful in helping our rescue efforts alongside our law enforcement partners. Janet Russon declined comment. Her husband told me she had signed a non-disclosure agreement with OUR. ESP failed. A psychic did not lead to Gardy's rescue. Prayer had not worked either, and neither did a far more extreme measure, torture. Here is what led up to such a desperate measure. The kidnapping in front of a Mormon chapel made worldwide news via an Associated Press story. Tim Ballard has told the Guardi kidnapping story perhaps hundreds of times. I reported on it in a previous video op-ed, so I won't go into detail here. Shortly after Gardy's disappearance, his father got a phone call. The call came from a phone number that Gesno recognized as belonging to a former employee from several years back. Just before the earthquake, a Haitian news outlet reported on the abduction. It wrote, Gardy Marty III, an American citizen by birth, was kidnapped December 6, 2009 by two men riding on a motorcycle in the front yard of a church. He lived in the Caribbean nation with his father, one of his Haitian-born parents. Since the little guardy is an American citizen, FBI agents are in Haiti to help Haiti police with the investigation. It showed the only photo I've ever seen of FBI and UN officers investigating. Ballard's investigation began four years after the kidnapping, and he embellishes his story. He said no one in Haiti talks, we went back to the church and interviewed every single person that was there that Sunday that Gardy was taken, and no one would talk. Gesno said that, like a year later, even his closest congregation members finally came to him and said, We did see Gardy taken by a motorcycle driver. 
Ballard and Gesno are wrong. When the FBI investigated, some church members did provide information. Utah adoption agent Cheryl Moyes gave me new information about the Guardi kidnapping. Moyes is co-founder of the Haitian Roots Nonprofit and manager of Wasatch International Adoptions. She's part of a Haiti to Mormon Families Adoption Pipeline and one of the nation's leading experts on Haitian adoptions. Gesno Marty's Foyer de Sion orphanage was and is a source for her clients long before Tim Ballard was involved. Right after the earthquake, she helped bring Gesno Marty's family to live in the United States, first in Ogden, Utah, then Idaho, then Florida, and finally St. George. Moyes provides a couple of new details about the kidnapping, details that OUR leaves out of the Guardy story. She says, Gesno told her that another son, Gus, two years older than Guardy, was with Guardy on the sidewalk at the time of the kidnapping. Gus either escaped being put on the motorcycle, or the kidnapper could not fit both boys on the motorcycle. He would have been an important eyewitness. Gesno told her that he did not quickly recognize the kidnapper's phone number as that of his former employee, Carlos Bristol, but concluded that sometime later. That phone number was the key evidence linking Carlos Bristol to the kidnapping and led to his arrest. Tim Ballard identifies three people who orchestrated Gardy's kidnapping and subsequent sale into sex or labor slavery. Carlos Bristol was arrested shortly after Gardy's disappearance in 2010. He was accused of abducting Gardy in front of the church and escaping on a motorcycle. He was a member of Marty's LDS ward and former employee at a Marty orphanage. V. Rose Pressois was arrested four years later, in 2014, after police and OUR raided her orphanage searching for Gardy. She was also a member of the Marty's Mormon ward. Wilson Bristol, Carlos's brother, was arrested eight years after the kidnapping, in 2018, after Ballard changed his mind and concluded that Wilson snatched little Gardy. OUR wanted Haiti police to force them to reveal what happened to Gardy. Haitian police, as part of an OUR sting operation to find Gardy, arrested Pressois and her daughter after they took $20,000 in the sale of two children. After the arrest, they interrogated Pressois. They demanded to know what she had done with Gardy. Where is he? They even offered to free her daughter, who was arrested with V. Rose, if she said what she knew about Gardy. OUR first resorted to prayer in real time as interrogators asked V. Rose Pressois about Gardy's whereabouts right after her arrest. Pressois is seen being interrogated as a translator in another room tells OUR operatives what she is saying. I think we should pray right now. Let's say it for really quick. He's starting this thing. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we ask you to please, please answer all the millions of prayers that have gone up to find this little boy. If he is alive, and if she, if, if he first knows where he's at, please, please soften her heart so that she will reveal this information to us. We might follow through and find Guardian. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Haiti's legal system is corrupt to say the least. Bribes to police, judges, and prosecutors are the norm. Presswell was not afforded any right to have an attorney present. Haiti police not only allowed OUR to listen to the interrogation and video record it, but also to participate in it directly. That's all illegal in the United States. During questioning, she did admit to the illegal sale of two children in connection with OUR's sting operation, but she would not admit to involvement in any Guardi kidnapping. OUR was ready with operatives and cameras to rescue Marty if she disclosed where he was. She did not. This is the time when you come clean. On everything, right now. No more lies. No more lies. Right, right now, you can't, you can't give lies. We have all the evidence, everything. This is the moment for you. 
Ah, dit, dit, dit. Point us in the right direction. We won't send your daughter to prison. You pas les vous petit frère en prison. On pas Carlos Bristol, the Haiti Mormon who had worked in Gesno Marty's orphanage, was in prison four years prior to Presswa's arrest. This photo is one OUR claims was taken of Carlos Bristol in prison. This is his Facebook photo where he posts that he was a returned Mormon missionary and attending a Haitian college. He was arrested right after the December 2009 kidnapping, imprisoned, and then tortured in an attempt to find Gardy's whereabouts. OUR operative Mark Mabry interviewed Gesno Marty about Carlos Bristol for a Slave Stealer podcast. During the interview, Gesno said, A guy working for me at the orphanage, he's the one who took Gardy first. They put him in jail, he never confessed. Gesno said police tried putting inmates in the cell with Carlos to get a confession. That did not work. Mabry then commented, I think that waterboarding and torture should be allowed in certain situations, and that's one of them. Gesno replied, They tried that. They put a plastic bag over his head. Gesno said while torture did not extract a confession as to Gardy's fate, it did induce Carlos to name an accomplice, who Gesno said was arrested and still in jail at the time of the 2017 interview. I've not learned the name of the accomplice. I'll now play the audio recording of that part of the interview. And they never confess, you know, they said they know nothing about it. He never confesses. No. I think waterboarding and torture should be allowed in certain situations. Maybe that's one of them. Uh, <laughs> because yes, well, at first, one day, you know, the first day when they got him, they, they tried to, they, you know, they even tried that. They did? Yeah. What did they well, tell they, me well, about it? Yeah, they, they did that. The guy who, who, who took him first. They put plastic bag in his head, intimidate him, you know. They put a plastic bag yeah, on his head? head? Yes, showing that they were serious about it. Hey, we're in Haiti. Anything goes. Right? <laughs> like, they plastic bag him on the head. They're interrogating him, scaring him. Then when it was a little bit hard. Ballard's view of the case is that the employee believed Gesno had come into some money and made a plan to kidnap Gardy and collect ransom money. But he can't do it himself so he turns to others who have experience in this loathsome business. The traffickers, Ballard believes, know they can make more money off him by either selling him or using him as a labor or sex slave and had no intention of returning him for ransom. The now former employee is in jail, Ballard said, refusing to cooperate, while it is believed the traffickers are exploiting poor little Gardy for their own enjoyment. What Ballard is saying is, is that Carlos Bristol is still in jail seven years after his arrest. Just a month after Bristol was arrested, the Deseret News reported, the FBI was called in and spent a week in Haiti following leads and interviewing the former employee who was considered a prime suspect. They turned the man over to Haitian authorities and left, while the man was in prison during the ongoing investigation. But the earthquake damaged prisons, and many prisoners either escaped or were released from unstable buildings. The suspect in the Marty case is back free on the island, and the priority given the investigation by the police dropped astronomically given the quake's aftermath. Fast forward eight years after Carlos Bristol was arrested to what OUR called Operation Wilson which was OUR's code name for the arrest of Wilson Bristol, Carlos's brother. Two years after the arrest, Ballard decided to show the video, writing that with Haitian law enforcement, we were able to track down Wilson and arrest him in 2018. This video shows never-before-seen footage of this operation. OUR went from being certain Carlos snatched Gardy to being certain it was Wilson. Ballard wrote, Bristol was a notorious gang leader and found to be one of Gardy's main traffickers. Wilson is the brother of Carlos, who was the one that physically kidnapped Gardy on the back of the motorcycle. We're going after a guy named Wilson Bristol. They call him Little Jamaican. 
That was the brother of Carlos Bristol. Carlos was working for Gesno. Wilson Bristol is a notorious gang leader now. And this guy is the one that trafficked Guardi uh, many years ago. So this is the first time we've had a lead this hot on Guardi in, in, in years. So this guy can give us all the information that we believe to have told to where he is. Okay. I just get him up. Let's go. Make sure you get that on camera. Come with us. Despite all OER's talk about the kidnapping suspects, most questions remain unanswered. How did Gesno even know that Carlos Bristol was tortured, yet did not reveal Guardi's whereabouts? Who else knew? Were any OUR operatives at the prison when Bristol was tortured? They were present, participated, and prayed when Press Watt was first interrogated. Was either Press Watt, the unnamed accomplice, or Wilson Bristol also tortured? What evidence was used to convict and imprison the kidnapped suspects? Are any still imprisoned? If not, how, when, and why were they released? Fine Guardi is the foundation upon which OUR was born seven years ago with what it called Operation Voodoo. The search continues to be Tim Ballard's top fundraising pitch. OUR movies, The Abolitionists, and Operation Toussaint highlight Operation Voodoo. Ballard tells the story countless times over the years that OUR is close to finding Guardi, keeping hope alive and donations flowing. The truth is not closer than ever, but the opposite, farther than ever. Without sharing any proof as usual, Ballard posts on Instagram, We haven't found him yet. We're getting closer than ever. We're putting more resources into this investigation than ever. We're going to find him. The latest Find Guardi campaign centers on the hat. Guardi's been moved around quite a bit, but everywhere we go looking for him, we end up rescuing more children, taking us into places we never would have gone otherwise. We haven't found him yet, but we are closer than ever. We are putting more resources into this investigation than ever. And we're gonna find him. And we're gonna find him really soon. Here's the truth about the we're close lies. When the search began with Operation Voodoo in 2014, Guardi had been missing four years and the chances of finding him even then were very low. Chances continue to get worse over time, despite the deployment of prayer, a psychic, and torture, and despite costing perhaps hundreds of thousands of dollars. The story, though, has helped raise millions of dollars. Okay, now to the last of the three Ballard whiteboard entities covered in this episode, the Orphanage in Haiti. Gesno Marty and his orphanages is a rags-to-riches story. From Taxi Driver in 1999, a small house orphanage with a tin roof, no electricity, no running water, no indoor toilet, to three orphanage houses and a downtown office by the time Ballard met him in 2013, handling more than 700 adoptions. Money poured in from multiple charities, a cut of adoption fees, plus monthly support fees for kids awaiting processing. Adoption fees could total more than $17 million. Maintenance fees per child for those kids awaiting adoption, it's a two to three year process, upwards of $250 a month. In 2003, a Utah charity constructed the Martys an $850,000 orphanage built on donated land. 
It was to replace the Gardy's tiny tin-roofed cottage housing 17 orphans. It had the attention of Haitian authorities. It was a model for future Haitian orphanages. The $850,000 included an endowment fund to run the facility. It was set up to facilitate Utah adoptions via LDS social services among private agencies. The Martys never assumed management of the showpiece orphanage built just for them. A Marty friend told me that Gesno did not want to operate it the way the group who built it wanted it run. They parted ways. Instead, Gesno and his wife Marjorie expanded to three orphanage sites at small rented houses plus a downtown Port-au-Prince office. Gesno Marty's brother, Harry, also a Mormon bishop, helped run them. Later, the brothers split, with Gesno running two sites and Harry taking over the third. Then, in about 2004, Gesno acquired donated property and several hundred thousand dollars to build an even grander orphanage. An outside, anonymous charity donated the money, and unlike the previous building, the money went straight to Gesno. This footnote, Harry's Orphanage, was supported by Idaho's Haitian Roots Foundation. Harry, like Gesno, stayed in Haiti and sent his wife and children to live in the United States. Harry's Orphanage was shut down late last year by its American charity. In 2005, construction began on Marty's Grand Orphanage outside Port-au-Prince. It was even more palatial than the previous showpiece. An anonymous donor made hundreds of thousands of dollars in payments directly to Gesno Marty, bypassing his Foyer de Sion Idaho-based charity. Gesno provided photos and receipts to show progress. It was designed as a self-sustaining paradigm. Solar panels to provide electricity during the day and charge batteries for night power. A rare internet connection to manage the sophisticated power system. A well and rooftop tanks for running water. An irrigated garden to raise crops for feeding kids. Goats and chickens to provide milk and eggs. An in-house pharmacy for medical supplies. Arrangements with a nearby school to educate kids paid for by a California nonprofit. All of this fell apart, though, due to tragedy, gross mismanagement, and possible corruption. Disaster struck just as the building is completed. Gardy is kidnapped. A massive earthquake devastates Haiti. The Gardy's downtown office was leveled. Two relatives on the orphanage payroll died when the office collapsed. Marjorie Marty was injured. One of their three orphanage houses was damaged, but no kids hurt. The near-completed new facility was pressed into greater service. International reporters interviewed the Martys. A British news outlet, The Independent, did a feature story on one of the Martys' orphans, whose only possession was her red tartan dress. It wrote, for the past week, she's been living and sleeping in the indescribably filthy backyard of the Foyer de Sion Orphanage in Pichonville. Pascal Marty, the orphanage's manager, says, We have almost nothing left. When the earthquake happened, I had $100 in my pocket to buy food. Another independent post-earthquake story reported on the orphanage itself. Here are some excerpts. At the Foyer de Sion Orphanage, I encounter a squalor. Twenty-eight girls and boys are down to their last few bags of beans and rice. They are thirsty, but have no drinking water. Bedrooms resemble a prison, with eight or more per room sleeping on filthy bunks. Excrement lines the floors. I do not see a single toy. The manager says a van arrived at the orphanage that morning from a Mormon church in Salt Lake City, and whisked ten of them away to new lives in the United States. But something about the Foyer de Sion doesn't smell quite right. There is no way, even before the quake, it was ever the comfortable place pictured on its website, which is perused by would-be adoptive parents. Adoption can be a lucrative business, and the Foyer de Sion requires would-be parents to pay fees of almost $20,000 to rescue a child, it isn't entirely clear where this money goes. 
In the months and years to come, someone must take a long, hard look at Haiti's orphanage industry. A year later, The Independent followed up its feature story about the Foyer de Sion orphan. Found, the nine-year-old orphan who became the symbol of Haiti's tragedy, whose only possession was a tartan dress. Now she has a school uniform and hope for the future. Her home is still a filthy orphanage on the outskirts of Port-au-Prince, where you won't find a single toy and where the children sleep up to eight to a room on rusty bunk beds. Even before the quake, it could take two to three years to finalize an adoption from Haiti. Well-meaning couples wishing to adopt from Haiti would have traditionally paid around $20,000 in fees, much of which ended up in the hands of the homes and their lawyers. And they would often also make additional donations during the adoption process. Multiple charities supported Marty's Foyer de Sion orphanage. Two were co-founded by Gesno Marty. Foyer de Sion LLC in 2002 in Rupert, Idaho, had the same name as the orphanage. And Sion Funds for Haiti in 2008, based in Canyon, California, plus others not directly tied to the Martys. Early Foyer de Sion officers were suspected of profiting off adoptions. New officers and directors replaced the original. There was a rocky relationship with Gesno Marty as they demanded more accountability and better management. But conditions at the orphanage worsened. Eventually, Tim Ballard and OUR cut off Foyer de Sion LLC funding and assigned a director, and the charity was dissolved. Joelle Burge is a former chairman of the nonprofit. She had extensive management training from Princeton and the Wharton School of Business. She told me, It was an uphill battle working with Gesno. We tried to get him a day-to-day -day operations manager. He was very resistant. The board wanted to fix broken solar panels on the roof. It was challenging getting receipts. He resisted attempts to improve the orphan intake system, that is, keeping track of incoming children. It was a mystery he could afford to educate his children in the United States. I think he had other sources of funding, perhaps preferring to just go with OUR. It was really frustrating. We were just told OUR is taking over. After the earthquake, Gesno Marty family members already had visas and passports. Marjorie Marty, with daughters Gail, Gesri, and Gloria, went to Utah, then Idaho, then Florida, supported by Haitian Roots Charity Associated Families. Harry's wife and children also moved to the United States. Jude Colas, Gesno's brother, another orphanage worker, moved to Utah. Gesno shuttled back and forth, visiting family and fundraising for OUR and his orphanage. In 2019, Gesno leaves Haiti and moves to the United States. Or does he? Tim Ballard said, It's too dangerous for Gesno to stay in Haiti. Gesno is penniless, having spent all of his money searching for Gardy. He needs to be home with his family in Utah. Tim Ballard pled for donations to help the Marty family come home. Home in Ballard speak was not Haiti, but Utah. He wrote, This will be the first time in the ten years since little Gardy's abduction that Gesno will be under the same roof as the rest of his family. But we cannot do it without your help. This was Ballard's pitch for donations. It's now no longer safe for Gesno to remain in Haiti, and we need to bring the Marty family home to Utah where they will be safe and can work closely with myself and team to help raise awareness and continue the search for Gardy. Coming from a third world country where all of their money has been spent on searching for their son, the Martys have only the clothes on their back and each other. What they need now more than anything is money. I mean, Gardy is the kid whose story created Operation Underground Railroad. The more we go looking for Gardy, a funny thing happens. Every time we look for him, we find other kids. Yes, no Marty, this father is just, he's my hero. We have never given up hope that we will find him. We have found a way for them to be together and fight this fight more effectively. 
And so this will be the first time since Gardy was taken years ago that this family is living together as a family. Donate and help us help the Marty family. The apparently penniless Gardies were settled in a Washington, Utah home near St. George. Is Ballard lying? Is it true Gesno faced grave new danger in Haiti and had to leave? Is it true he actually moved to Utah? And is it true he was penniless? A close Marty family friend, Corey MacArthur, is not aware Gesno left Haiti. The MacArthurs knew the Marty family long before the earthquake. Gesno called Carrie MacArthur the day Gardy was abducted. Larry MacArthur was in Haiti and present in one of the FBI's meetings with Gesno. Corey MacArthur spoke with Gesno by phone as recently as March this year. He was in Haiti. He still lives in Haiti, but comes to visit, she said. He's still looking for Gardy. Gesno was working on a new lead that weekend. He has people overseeing the orphanage's operation, she said. And she believes Gesno owns the donor-paid-for orphanage. As I mentioned, OUR took over the orphanage's fundraising. That effort is now a subset of what Ballard calls the Gardy Effect. That is also a project of Operation Underground Railroad. This all happened near the time that Ballard, on his whiteboard chart, showed an orphanage as an OUR entity. And near the same time, Ballard raised money to get Gesno out of Haiti and purportedly moved to Utah. The Guardia Effect has a website. It says the orphanage is for placing Haitian children into forever families. That's Mormon speak for Mormon families. It says, Foyer de Sion is an orphanage, child trauma rehabilitation center, and school for children in Haiti, founded by Gesno Marty following the kidnapping of his son Gardy. That's OUR revisionist history. It was formed long before Gardy disappeared. Goes on to say, Foyer de Sion aspires to be the leading organization. Well, it's really an example of how to waste hundreds of thousands of dollars. There's a button on the website to donate, but it's through OUR. There are no Guardi Effect public tax returns to provide transparency. The entity Guardi Center at Foyer de Sion is a Utah DBA established in September 2018. It was formed by OUR's board chairman and accountant, Kelly Wilson. It's owned by Utah's Equity Trust Foundation. The directors are Ken Krogh and John Moreland. They're also directors for Tim Ballard's entity, Liberty 89. These are related entities not on Ballard's whiteboard. John Moreland is a former OUR president. Brad Brower is Apostle Russell Ballard's son-in-law. You might recall he is also involved with slave stealers. The Liberty 89 team consists of OUR operatives Hugh Vale and Mark Mabry. Vale is believed to be a witness for the ongoing criminal investigation. And Attorney General Sean Reyes is a Liberty 89 speaker. Just what are OUR's plans for its involvement with the Haiti Orphanage shown on Ballard's whiteboard, which OUR also calls the Gardy Center at Foyer de Sion? OUR's Orphanage Director Jeff Frazier said, As of July 2020, that means we are developing management and capital deployment methods within a large orphanage near Port-au-Prince, Haiti. He said, once best practices are developed, we will seek to scale those methods across Haiti. This will make way for far larger numbers of child rescues. This may indicate OUR plan to monetize the orphanage and to acquire more of them in Haiti, perhaps beyond. After about two years of OUR involvement, the orphanage, by OUR's own admission, is a mess, probably no better than when Gesno Marty ran it into the ground. Despite having millions of dollars in the bank, OUR has not invested much in the orphanage. 
instead continues asking donors to pay for what has been a money pit. In a YouTube video, it is not an orphanage critic, but OUR's own director who points out the orphanage's squalid state. There's no running water here. Uh, there's no electricity. There is uh, a generator back there. Uh, there's also solar on the roof, uh, but the solar's broken. Uh, uh, and the water pump broke because they didn't have the funds to fix that. The food, uh, one of the women I was interviewing today, um, the, one of the leaders, our supervisors, uh, she was telling me how she had to pick, she had to pick worms out of the rice before she could cook it. And she was telling me about her tears inside as she was having to put her straight face on. The nannies um, are incredible. They're the ones who stay with these kids 24-7. Um, but because they don't have any electricity and don't have any running water, they have to wash them. You can see they're everywhere. Uh, they wash them back there in that, the back of that trailer um, by hand. And I'm not kidding, this woman's fingernails were falling off because she was having to wash so many clothes. I can't imagine. And we can help these people. Evaluating Tim Ballard's whiteboard plan that shows the orphanage in Haiti, there is no transparency. OUR has provided no accounting of how it's funding the Foyer de Sion orphanage. The public does not know how much they've raised, or the amount of money they've spent, or how they spent it. The public has no idea how much money over the years, or recently, has been lost to mismanagement or fraud. Tim Ballard may not know how to run an orphanage, but he is adept at creating an image that motivates donors to contribute tens of millions of dollars to his Finding Guardy and Rescuing Child Sex Slaves causes. He has been aided by Utah's mainstream news media that disseminates Ballard's propaganda beginning at the beginning with Gesno Marty's search for his kidnapped son and continuing to this day. Aided by Utah's mainstream press that reports propaganda as if it were actual news. Ballard's image making began on day one, that is, at the very beginning of OUR, and Ballard's relationship with Gesno Marty in 2013. Ballard tells the story of their first meeting at a Thanksgiving Point, Utah restaurant. Ballard was still an agent with Homeland Security. It's a story he tells over and over, like this interview with his book publisher. But I believe you met an angel, a mortal angel, yes. named Guess No Marty. Yes. Did I get that right? Yeah. And, yeah, and so he was doing. very instrumental in starting, I become the godfather of Operation Underground Railroad. And I learned about this case, and I just, I just, my heart melted, of course, and, and especially being that he was a bishop. And so I flew him up to, to the United States, to Salt Lake, and I said, what's being done to find your son? And I'm thinking, I'm gonna make this a U.S. case. I, I can do this, he's a U.S. citizen. So I'm gonna make this a U.S. case, and I start, I start getting to work, right? And mm -hmm. I find out in a couple of weeks, the DOJ comes back and they say, Tim, back off. This is a Haitian crime, you're not going to Haiti. It happened in Haiti by Haitians, let it go. Ballard was not truthful in that interview. The DOJ considered it a crime, even if committed in Haiti. The FBI did investigate, and the United Nations helped as well. At the same Utah County dinner meeting, as Ballard tells it, I foolishly invited him to the nicest restaurant at Thanksgiving Point. I thought I was doing something kind, but he totally feels out of place. We order this food and he's looking at it, and then he's just like, this could feed 10 of my kids for a week. He just took like a little bit of the food for himself. He was leaving the next morning, so he's like, this food won't perish, I'll be able to take it back to my kids. And so the myth-making begins. Gesno had visited the States many times before the Thanksgiving Point meeting on fundraisers, reunions, and for Gardy's birth. If a $50 meal would feed 10 kids for a week, then a $1,500 airfare 
multiplied by the number of U.S. visits, multiplied again by the number of family members along with Gesno, would feed 300 plus kids for a week, times the multipliers, probably into the thousands of children. A friend of the Martys told me she dined with Gesno many times in the States before his 2013 Ballard meeting, and he never asked for a doggy bag to take food back to the orphanage. At the time Gesno met Gallery, Gesno's orphanage had taken in hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations, adoption fees, maintenance fees, tons of donated food, plus countless hours of donor labor. As I said earlier, by 2013, his orphanage had facilitated more than 700 adoptions costing twenty dollars to $30,000 each, amounting to an estimated $17.5 million, a small cut of which was his profit. At the time of Gesno's Ballard meeting, his family had been living in the United States for three years, and his children attending school in Utah, Idaho, then Florida, largely paid for by donations. Since then, Ballard has used Gesno Marty repeatedly for fundraising and politicking. Much of Haiti's orphanage system is just another form of human trafficking, fueled by greed and despair. Was Gesno's orphanage, now part of Ballard's whiteboard plan, any different, any less corrupt? Wrapping up this report, here are some facts about Haiti orphanages. There have been upwards of 723 in Haiti. Adoption became big business not only for orphanages, but for the Haitian government. Almost no kids in Haiti orphanages are rescued sex and labor slaves. Most are not even orphans, but dropped off by one or more parents. Many Haitian parents, because of poverty and out of despair, cannot feed and educate their kids. Or greedy, wanted kids adopted to rich countries with the expectation of getting back remittances. Which is to say, in Haiti, it got into the lucrative adoption business of selling kids. Haitian's adoption system became one of the most corrupt and least transparent in the world, worsened by the 2010 earthquake and subsequent hurricanes. Here's an orphanage quiz. Is the main goal preserving birth families or selling kids into adopted families? If more donor assistance money goes to helping keep the child's family together than is spent to adopt the child out to a new family, then it is birth family focused. If the number of orphanage children returned to their birth parents exceeds the number placed with adoptive parents, then there's still no priority given to adoptions. If birth parents who are asked to legally relinquish a child are first offered financial assistance, food, education, health care, before signing over the child, then yes, still birth family focused. The Marty Orphanage would not have come close to passing that test. Like the majority of Haiti orphanages, they were more about selling kids than restoring families. Marty's Orphanage was established at the very beginning as a kid adoption outlet, and there's no sign that ever changed. Here is one story, one the Wall Street Journal called a surreal story, about a mother waving goodbye to her child as she was taken by its adoptive parent. The mother was a worker at a Utah-supported orphanage and would not have lacked the resources to support her daughter. Here are excerpts from the article. When David Aiken, an internet entrepreneur from Provo, Utah, traveled to Haiti last year to meet a girl he was in the process of adopting, he was shocked to find out that her mother worked at the orphanage. When he learned the mother was there, we thought, we can't adopt her. 
I couldn't imagine taking a child from her mother, he recalls. But the mother insisted. In the end, David was happy to take her. When he embarked for the airport with the daughter, her mom was smiling on the porch, waving, he recalled to the journalists. It was surreal. Here's the fundamental OUR fallacy. Rescuing so-called child sex or labor slaves or adopting out relinquished children does not attack the root of the main problem, which is poverty. Most child sex workers, sex slaves as Ballard calls them, laborers, in Haiti they're called Restavex, and relinquished children were not kidnapped. They're not slaves, even if that's what Ballard wants people to think. Poverty drives many parents worldwide to allow their children, mostly girls, to engage in prostitution, allow their children to engage in child labor such as agriculture, military, and housework, place their children in so-called orphanages for adoption. It takes far less money to keep a child in a poor family than the cost for it to go to an adoptive family. The international children's law and adoption expert, David Smolin, wrote a law review article titled Intercountry, which means across international borders, adoption as child trafficking. He wrote, to some, intercountry adoption in itself is more or less a form of child trafficking, as it involves the transfer of children from poor nations to rich nations in order to meet the demand of those in rich nations for children. Others view intercountry adoption as a beautiful act of compassion. Relinquishing parents often earn less than $2 a day. It could be argued that relatively small amounts of money might help keep the child with the birth family. As an ethical matter, it is perverse to spend thousands of dollars taking a child from the birth family when a much smaller sum would have kept the family intact. Thanks for watching. This now becomes the tenth in a series of YouTube published reports about Operation Underground Railroad.